Shalom, beloved. A word. Today we're going to talk about re rebellion versus obedience. Rebellion versus obedience. And I'm sure right now that the um, video is... My image is kind of crazy, and forgive me for that. The computer's doing its own thing. In time, I will get another computer. Again, we're speaking about rebellion versus obedience. <clears throat> Two of the people we're going to talk about when we speak of rebellion. We're going to look at Nimrod, and we're going to look at Esau. Nimrod, and we're going to look at Esau, okay? The reason we're going to look at Nimrod, Nimrod is not actually a name. It's more of something spoken of to a person's character. Nimrod means rebel. Nimrod means rebel the worst kind of rebel of them all. You can liken calling somebody a Nimrod to calling them a criminal. A Nimrod spiritually is a rebel. And that's what the name means. He was called a rebel. His name was Amraphel. His name was Amraphel. And when you read in the book of Jasher, chapter 27, verse 2, you hear about um, Nimrod, and you also hear about Esau. These two are very similar. If you were to call somebody a Nimrod, they are a rebel. But who are they rebelling against, beloved? They are rebelling against the Most High. They rebel against the most high. They are a spiritual criminal. They are a disobedient rebel. And Nimrod's name means rebel. His actual name was Amraphel. We read about him. He was a king in Shinar. He also fought against Abraham and lost. But you read about him also in the book of Jasher. But there's another thing about Nimrod. Nimrod and Esau have something in common. Nimrod, Nimrod also known as Amraphel, that's his real name, and Esau have something in common, beloved. And what that is, there are only two people in the Bible that are called hunters. One was Nimrod, the rebel. He's a rebel. His name is Amraphel. And the other person called a hunter is Esau in the Bible. You do not find anyone mentioned in the same regard as having the term hunter attached to them as you will Nimrod and Esau. Okay, Nimrod, he's described as a king in the land of Shinar, according to the book of Genesis and the book of Chronicles. He's the son of Cush. The Bible states that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord and began to be mighty in the earth. He's a mighty hunter, this rebel. He rebels against the Most High. How do we know that? He's the one associated with the Tower of Babel. He was in rebellion. Now, he is called a mighty hunter. A mighty hunter. And we have to question why that was likened to Esau as well. Nimrod and Esau are the only two men in the Bible called hunters. And they have much in common. 
Yeah. The fact that Esau is described as a hunter like Nimrod, the rebel, it gives us some insight into Esau's true character. Yes, beloved. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. His true character. Okay. We are told that Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. That's the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verse 27. A man of the field, he was a cunning hunter, crafty, that's Esau. He was a man of the field. Mm. What is the field? Let's go scripturally. What does the field represent? Esau was a cunning hunter. Mm. Cunning, crafty, deceptive, using any and many means necessary to get his prey. But he was a hunter, a man of the field. What is the field? Scripturally, we go to the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 38. The field is the world. That's exactly what the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 38. The field is the world. The field is the world. But we are told that Esau is described as a cunning hunter, a man of the field. Mm. Yes, yes. The field is the world. So we can conclude that Esau was typically worldly minded. He, he's out in the world hunting. It doesn't tell you what he's hunting. We just assume, yes, we know Isaac loved his venison and the different things that Esau would get, the game he would get. But you, you, you have to understand that the, the scripture, remember, it's a two-edged sword. The word of the Lord is a two-edged sword, sharper. It is, it cuts so it's dividing. One part, yes, he is hunting wild game. Mm. We're hunting game. But if he's got the spirit of a hunter in him, Esau, and he goes into the field, and we know according to the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 38, the field is the world. He's going all over the world hunting. He's crafty. He's deceptive. He's cunning. Hmm. So, Esau's a hunter. Nimrod, whose real name is Amraphel, he too was a mighty hunter. Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. He too was a mighty hunter. Okay. Nimrod means rebel. Now, when we look at Jacob, when we look at Jacob and the description of Jacob in comparison to Esau, Jacob, they called him a plain man. They called him a plain man. Jacob was described as a plain man, that's Genesis chapter 25, verse 27. The Hebrew word for plain is the same word translated in other scriptures as perfect, upright, undefiled. So when we hear these watered down versions of Jacob, we find out through the Hebrew and how they translated it, Plain makes us think there wasn't much to him when in reality he was an upright man, undefiled. So the word plain refers to Jacob's character. Jacob was a man of God. Mm, mm, mm. Throughout scripture, God records his highest praise and blessing for Jacob. Mm. Okay. The Lord chose Jacob to himself and Israel for his particular treasure. Psalm 135 verse 4. And the scripture records twice, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Why? The character, the character. 
Remember, Nimrod and Esau are the only people in Scripture described as hunters, hunters, true hunters. We hear Nimrod, Nimrod, mighty hunter before God, and Esau, a cunning hunter, a man of the field. But we know according to the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 38, the field is the world. Mm. Mm. We also know that when Esau sold his birthright, he really didn't regard it very much. He had the not only the right to the firstborn inheritance, he would have inherited that blessing. From his father. But he had no regard for it. Why? Because he was a man of the world. He was a hunter. All right. Now, we know about the rebel. That's what Nimrod means. And we're talking about rebellion versus obedience. Rebellion versus obedience, beloved. Rebellion versus obedience. Now, a lot of people don't know, okay, that rebellion against the Most High is the, as the sin of witchcraft. It's like you are a witch performing witchcraft. As a matter of fact, to be exact, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Okay? This is one of the ways King Saul lost the anointing and the kingdom through rebellion. So we know if Amraphel was, he was so rebellious against the Most High that he was written down in scripture as Nimrod. It tells you the level of the rebellion that Nimrod was known for. All right. Now, one of the things, remember, Esau too is a might, is a hunter. He just like Nimrod, so is Esau. God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. Hmm. He was a man of the field. According to the book of Matthew, the field is the world. He rejected his spiritual inheritance. Esau did. Sold it for a meal. Sold it for a meal. Hmm. We talked about rebellion. Rebellion is as witchcraft, beloved. Witchcraft. Idolatry. Now, many people not knowing any better have behaved under rebellion because this system, like Esau, is very cunning, very crafty. They hunt people, the, the, the souls of people, who the enemy in this system. How so? Many of us run into problems. We have questions. We go through issues in our lives. We need a refreshing. We, we need a word. The problem is the spirit of Esau, that cunning hunter of the field, man of the field, the field being the world, he's hunting that spirit, that spirit of rebellion is hunting the people of the Most High. Many of us have been exposed to habits that we should never practice. What do I mean? Book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 9 through, 12, 9 through 12. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter 
to pass through the fire or uses divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter of familiar spirits, um, fortune tellers or wizard or a necromancer. What is a necromancer? Someone that consults spirits of the dead. You have many people who come from, and I'm just, even Africa, and will say, you know, we're praising the ancestors. We're praying to the spirits of our ancestors. No, no, not according to the world. I mean, not according to the word. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 9 through 12, but I'm going to go down below. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter pass through the fire or that uses divination, Ouija boards, consulting mediums, and uh, fortune tellers, or an observer of times, an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, or a necromancer, beloved. Trying to find where I had the definition. But basically what it is telling you is you shall not consult people who who consult spirits of the dead. Saul did it. Trying to pull up Samuel. Mm. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Mm. For all. All that do these things, some things, beloved, we have done in ignorance because we are among those other nations and the spirit of Esau, that cunning, crafty hunter, can trick many people. You see it on commercial. You know, this person who can read your fortune and tell you things from the past and familiar spirits observers of times, an enchanter or witch, a charmer or a consulter of familiar spirits or wizard or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. So the Lord drove those nations out. Because these were some of their habits. But in our captivity, many of these same nations that were driven out from among us when we were brought into Canaan, they are here in the land of our captivity. And they tried to make these things a normal thing. Oh, no, you can call up a fortune teller. No. No. What is good? What does the Most High say? For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Mm. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God drove them out from before thee. Who? Those nations. Those nations, beloved. We're talking about rebellion versus obedience. Rebellion versus obedience. And rebellion is like unto witchcraft and idolatry. Idolatry unto the Lord. Stubbornness. I ain't going to do it. It's like idolatry. Witchcraft unto the Lord. That's why Amraphel got the nickname that stuck to him. It's like criminal. You, you. Some people are so criminal minded that when they see that person, man, he a criminal. They don't even call him by name. That's a criminal. That criminal. And you, what? Who? He a criminal. That's the same spiritually when you call somebody Nimrod. Spiritually, he is the worst criminal of them all. He's a rebel. He's a rebel. All right. A mighty hunter before God. Mighty. Esau, too, was known as a hunter. A man of the fields. And when we look in the book of Matthew chapter 13 verse 38. We line upon line, precept upon precept. The field is the world. Now, that is those who are in disobedience. Okay? In disobedience. 
during the time of Nimrod, when you read in the book of Jasher and it talks about Nimrod, okay, it talks about Nimrod. It is Jasher trying to get you a beloved bear with me. The book of Jasher, chapter 27, verse 2. We see Esau and we also see Nimrod when? During the time of Abraham's death. <clears throat> One of the things that, and I was trying to remember which book I got this out of. Uh, one of the things when you go through the lineage, all right, when Noah and Shem, we're going through the line of Shem, you look at the years, all right, and to give you an understanding of what I mean, Abraham, who was still alive, Noah lived 60 years into the life of Abraham. Yes, my love. Yes, yes, yes. And Shem actually lived 210 years from Abraham's birth and outlived him by 35 years. Yes. So were those ancient forefathers among Abraham? These who followed the Most High. Yes, they were, beloved. So he was experiencing seasons of refreshing, getting that pure word from those who had followed the Most High obediently, obediently. I am trying to make sure I run it right. Noah lived the first 60 years of Abraham's life. So it lines up with the book of Jasher. It lines up. Beloved. Noah lived. I'm trying to find a book. I believe it's in Genesis where it tells you Noah. It gives you his years. It tells you Shem when he had his children. Our facts said Selah, Eber, Pele, Ru, Saru, Nahor. When you do the math. And forgive me for not being able to call that book. But it gives you the years, they, the line of Shem, when they were having their children. You will see, much to your surprise, that Shem did, in fact. He was alive when Abraham was alive, and he actually outlived Abraham by 35 years. Remember, these are people from the antediluvian years, from the antediluvian age when they lived longer. Abraham had come after. So even though man's years were decreasing, Abraham still, the, the, the fullness of the Most High's decree about 120 years wasn't complete yet because Abraham lived to be 175. Now, when you are in obedience, even in your worst moments, beloved, in your worst moments, you are to follow the Most High and His Word. And what do I mean? A lot of us, we need a season of refreshing, a season of refreshing. The rebels, when they want something, they consult spirits of the dead. They go against the Word of the Most High, and it is an abomination unto them. They have no honor for the Most High and His spiritual truths. But we look at David when he was in Ziglag. When he was in Ziglag. And the Amalekites robbed David and his men. And they took the women, the children, everything they had. The men came back. This is um, Book of Samuel, chapter 30. David strengthened himself in the Lord. Book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, chapter 30. The men were so upset 
because David had them out doing some other work for a Philistine king, even though he wasn't going to be the help that king thought he would be. But while they were gone, everything they had was taken. The men and David weep themselves to exhaustion. But then the men started to turn on David. They started talking about stoning him. But David never was rebellious against the Most High. Even in his worst moment, he went and sought the Lord. He sought the Lord. He encouraged himself in the word of the Lord. This is in the darkest hours, beloved, because some of us, we have those dark times, and they will come. But we can look to King David and what he did. He encouraged himself in the word of the Lord. And then he consulted the Lord. No, not a familiar spirit. No, not a fortune teller. No, no, no. Not a tea leaf reader or tarot card person. Mm -mm. Not a necromancer. He was not a rebel. He was not a spiritual criminal like Nimrod. He consulted the Lord. And then, because they had taken everything David and his men had, he went to the high priest. The Most High can put you in a position in his house. That does not mean that even though David was king, he respected the fact that the priests also had their job and their position. He never dishonored it. Even when you talk about the different women in the Bible, they never dishonored the men who had the, the Levites or the priests. They honored them. They honored the king. But more than anything, always first, they honored the Most High. It was never a disrespect. And even David, being king, he knew. Not only did he encourage himself in the word of the Most High, he went to the high priest to consult that Urim Thummim to get an answer. Shall I go up to recover what has been taken from us? He needed a word from the Lord. And the word came and said, go up, go up, go up. Understand the season of refreshing, beloved. There is a season of refreshing, okay? When even in his distress, Psalm 18, in my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. This is David talking. He's encouraging himself. He's obedient even under some of the worst moments in his life. His own men want to kill him. They done took the men's kids, their wives, their children, all their stuff. David had to go get a loan and get a word from the Lord. He was not a rebel. He was obedient. He was obedient, beloved. And then he had to wait patiently. And this sometimes is hard on us, beloved. I wait. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Yes, yes. David got an answer. It's the season of refreshing. Some of us, beloved, we need that. We're in that need for a season of refreshing. We've gone through some. We need a word from the Lord. And when that word comes, and it will come, beloved, then come the season of refreshing. When we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 18, for they refresh my spirit as well as yours, who Paul is talking about people, spiritual minded people that helped him. And he was refreshed, beloved. When we look at Psalms 3, Proverbs 3, Chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil, that rebellious disobedience. It will be healing 
to your flesh mm, and refreshment to your bones. That season of refreshing comes upon you. Okay? That season, even when we look at Psalm 23, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. When you are in distress, just like King David was at Ziglag, and everything you can think to do isn't working, and people start turning on you, and, and you're in distress, you turn to the Most High. He will hear you. He will hear you. David was speaking to the Lord. As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food night and day. While men say unto me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. David is talking to the Lord. He's talking to him. Those Psalms that we read. That's King David encouraging himself while giving praise to the word, to the Most High God. And that refreshing, that season of refreshing. Beloved, there's a lot I would like to say, but I know this has run over. And I was sitting and thinking about Nimrod, the rebel. His name is Amraphel. You read about him, he's in the book of Genesis, he's uh, from the king of one of the kings of the land of Shinar. He is the king of the land of Shinar, he's in the book of Jasher, chapter 27, it speaks of him. And also look at the parallel between Nimrod and Esau. They were rebels, they were rebels. When we read these translations, these English translations, because Allow me to say this as well as I keep being admonished for the manner that I speak in. Many people, I'm going to assume criticism to the day I die. Let's just go there. But when they feel as though I don't speak right, this language that you hear is English. It is a Germanic language. This is not the Hebrew tongue that I am speaking. So even when we speak, beloved, you are not going to hear that pure language because this language is the language, it is a testament of who took us, where they took us. We did not speak a Germanic language, English, which is a Germanic language. This was not our dialect. This was not our tongue. So, I do honor the Most High, and no, I am not a rebel, and nor do I, nor do I encourage rebellion at all. But I'm trying to open your mind, beloved, to see beyond just what's put in front of you. The spirit of Esau, that hunter, man of the field, the field being the world, he hated. Jacob, he saw his life at one point. Jacob had to bring him gifts and try to make peace. But Esau was not feeling Jacob. Come on now. He wasn't feeling him. And it seems to stand that way to this day. And he wants to cause Jacob's fall any way he can. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found beloved. And that season of refreshing shall come upon you. Some people are in rebellion. Some people have been taught rebellion and they don't know any better. And that's all right, because now you do know. And there's a reason this is being put out here, because there's somebody who needs to hear it. You be blessed, beloved, and refreshed with the truth. The season of refreshing has come. Shalom.